Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. We're going to continue on here talking about the neck pain classification system. In the previous video, we looked at neck pain with mobility deficit. That's really class one. We're going to move on to class two, which is really the neck pain with movement coordination impairments. So in neck pain with mobility deficits, this is where there's either central or unilateral neck pain and a particular neck motion. It could be flexion or extension. It could be protraction or rotation, lateral flexion, any one of those motions consistently reproduces that neck pain. And there's a lot of things that can cause this. It could simply be postural. It could be that some muscles are tight for whatever reason. It could be even as simple as stress, causing a muscle to be tight, and then you get mobility deficits with neck pain. When we look at class two, neck pain with movement coordination impairments, now we're thinking about a different type of mechanism. And understand that this is a common mechanism, but it's not the only mechanism. But that's some kind of trauma to the head and neck. So look here at common symptoms associated with this classification. So whiplash associated disorder, or just whiplash. Number two here, we've got post-concussive symptoms. So symptoms that people have after a concussion. So if somebody suffers a concussion, that's a mild traumatic brain injury, or mild TBI. And that's caused by a blow to the head, obviously. And since the head is connected to the neck, anytime you have a blow to the head, there's also the potential for neck problems as well. Now, number three doesn't fit that trauma kind of category, but persistent neck pain, you can also see movement coordination impairments. And number four here, any signs or symptoms consistent with vestibular issues and or dizziness. And so overall, the common theme here is really trauma, any kind of trauma to the head and or the neck. And so common examples you might run into would be a motor vehicle accident. That one's really common. You could also see people who previously or currently are serving in the military. And then we've got falls. And don't think that falls are only things we have to worry about in the geriatric population. Uh, it is more common just because they do have things like loss of sensation, uh, loss of muscle mass, loss of balance, all things that contribute to falling. However, children can fall, infants can fall or could be dropped. You can also have people under the influence of a substance like alcohol. They trip, they fall, they injure their head or their neck. Okay? So trauma is kind of the major theme here, although even people with persistent neck pain, although the persistent neck pain could occur as a result of some trauma in the past. And you'll notice here I have examination and interventions. And the reason for that is any one of these three tests, even though they're exam items, they can also be given as treatments where the person just practices what you would do exactly in the test. Okay? And so practice, practice, practice. Any one of these can be a treatment. Now, individually, we're going to go over all three of these in separate videos. So I won't spend too much time on these, but I want to get the basic idea of all three of these. The first two especially heavily involve a group of muscles in the anterior neck called the deep neck flexors. The first one we'll look at is the craniocervical flexion test, which is shown up here. The basic idea is the person's lying in supine right here, and right here there's this blood pressure cuff. It can be a blood pressure cuff that you use to take normal blood pressure, which of course connects to something that looks like this, although it's a little bit different, obviously. Or there's a cuff that's specific for this test. You'll notice that the values on here go all the way up to 200. Then there's some different colors here, uh, depending on what your goal is. So this one is actually specific for this particular test. This cuff is going to lie behind the neck in contact with the person's occiput. And basically, they are going to perform a chin tuck. Now, when they perform a chin tuck, that's going to put pressure on this cuff. And when you put more pressure on this cuff, you'll see the gauge here rise up a certain amount in proportion to how much pressure you're putting on it. Okay? So this is really more like target training. You look here, you've got 20 and then 40 up here, and really we're looking at these little marks, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, and all the way up to 30, which is right here. 
And the goal of the test is to be able to hold that chin tuck specifically at 20. And then you go on and hold it specifically at 22. And then you go on and hold it specifically at 24 and then 26 and 28 and 30. Okay. So this is more like a target training almost for the deep neck flexors. Okay. When we look at the actual deep neck flexor endurance test right here, there's no blood pressure cuff. The person performs this chin tuck and actually brings the occiput off of the table by about an inch and they just hold it. So this is really an endurance test. It uses the same muscles as this first one, but the goal of the deep neck flexor endurance test is just to hold that position as long as possible. And the test would be terminated if there's excessive activation of the sternocleidomastoid, which you don't want here. You actually don't want much contraction of the SCM. It's really the deep neck flexors. Or if there's a lot of shaking going on because the person's really struggling, then you terminate that test and you get a time. Obviously, the longer this position is able to be held, the better. Now, these first two tests heavily rely on the deep neck flexor muscle group. The third one does use them. It just uses them in a different way. And that's the joint position error test. So you see this target right here. In the dead center, the bullseye basically, there's a black dot. And then away from that, you've got degrees. One degree, two degree, three degree, 4.5 degree, six degree. And the person you're treating is going to have this little attachment on their head that they'll wear, and there's a laser on top of it. And they'll face this target, and the laser should be pointing directly on that bullseye, on that black dot. And the distance between the laser and the black dot should be 90 centimeters. So initially you start the test with the person having the laser directly on that black dot. And you tell them, close your eyes, keep your eyes closed, and rotate your head, let's say to the right, as much as you can. They rotate it to the right as much as they can, and while keeping their eyes closed, they then bring their head back to what they feel is the original starting position. And you look at where the laser comes back to. In a perfect test, the laser would come right back to the bullseye, indicating that that person had no problems. But in reality, for most people, the laser might end up here, or here, or here, right? But as long as it's in this green region right here, it's a negative test, okay? This would be considered normal, even if it's all the way out here where my mouse is, okay? That's still pretty close to that bullseye, okay? But in a person with movement coordination impairments, what you might actually see is they rotate their head all the way out to the right with the eyes closed and then bring it back, and maybe the laser's out here, okay, in the yellow region. Now, the yellow region is not necessarily a positive test, but it may indicate that the person might have some joint position error and maybe some movement coordination impairments. If they bring it back and it's in the red region, that is definitively a positive test, and it's very likely that the person does have movement coordination impairments. Okay? So for a person who fits class 2 right here, with movement coordination impairments, when they do this test and they rotate their head all the way out and bring it back, we might expect them to bring the laser back to the yellow or red regions. Yellow would be probably positive, but interpret with caution. Red would be positive, okay? Now, one of the papers that looked at the joint position error test actually recommended that for a particular movement, so we said we had the patient go out to the right and then come back, right and then come back, you actually do six repetitions in each direction. So that'd be six repetitions going out to right rotation, but you also do the other three directions. So six repetitions going out to left rotation and back, left rotation and back, six rotations going down, which would be cervical flexion and back, cervical flexion and back, and then six repetitions going up, which would be cervical extension. Okay. And the more of these that you actually land in the red and yellow, the more likely it is that the person has movement coordination impairments. Now, as we said, any one of these examination items can be given as an intervention, as a treatment. Have the patient practice that, and theoretically they'd get better at it. But that's not all we do. We also need to do muscle retraining, specifically muscles in the neck and muscles in the shoulder girdle or the scapula. Now with the muscle retraining, there is no cookie cutter approach. However, the muscles that you're focusing on should be the ones that have functional deficits. So if you find 
that the patient had a positive craniocervical flexion test and positive deep neck flexor endurance test, maybe they can only hold this for five seconds, then you should probably focus on those deep neck flexors, right? And focus on active cervical retraction, okay? But we also need to think about the stabilization function of these muscles. So what you see here are four different stabilization exercises, okay? Uh, in this first one, this person is applying an anterior force on the back of his head. So he's basically trying to push his head forward. And so he's relying on some of these posterior muscles back here, especially the deep neck extensors, to maintain this position. So this is really isometric work. Over here on the bottom right, he's pushing his head backwards. And so in order to resist that, he's having to use the deep neck flexors and actively retract against his posterior force from his hand. And then you see something similar for these two right here. On the bottom left here, he's actually giving himself a force into left lateral glide, or you could think of it as left lateral flexion. And so he's having to resist with muscles that would produce right lateral glide or right lateral flexion. And then this one is the exact opposite. And again, this is isometric work. And when he does this, he's going to be holding for a longer period of time. Remember, the deep neck flexors and many of the other muscles in there, like up here are the suboccipitals, deep neck extensors, these are endurance muscles. Now these muscles are not like the quadriceps, they're not like the gluteus maximus, right? Those two muscles, for example, can lift a lot of weight. They're very strong. So when we're trying to rehab those or strengthen those, we're going to use high resistance, low duration. Okay? For these, we're going to use low resistance, high duration. Okay? So this is really low load endurance training. And one recommendation might be loading at 20% or less of the maximal volitional contraction force. Okay? So basically like 20% of the 1RM for that muscle. So this is not much force. And this is really the max you're using, not any more than that. So longer duration training. So low force long duration. Um, you can hold five to 10 seconds. For some of these, like the deep neck flexor endurance test, you might hold a lot longer than that if you're practicing it. But for these stabilization exercises, more like five to 10 seconds, okay? And if some of these become a little bit too easy for the patient, you're actually gonna progress the load first. Um, you don't actually need to progress the duration as much. You might keep it upwards of 10 seconds, but you're actually gonna uh, progress the load. So maybe instead of 20%, if that becomes too easy, then you might go to 25 or 30%, okay? So that's for the cervical musculature. For the scapular muscles or shoulder girdle muscles, that's what axioscapular means, it's really the same thing. We need to relate it to the functional deficits. So if there's no issues with the, let's say, serratus anterior, then there's not really any reason to really target the serratus anterior. But if we have weakness in the rhomboids and middle traps, then we definitely need to focus on scapular retraction, okay? And so here's some examples of exercises that can be done. This one right here, this patient is undergoing active scapular retraction, okay? He's not doing a row, he's just activating the rhomboids and middle traps to pull those shoulder blades together. This one is a push-up with a plus. So he's doing a normal push-up, but then at the top, even with the elbows completely extended, you can push up a little further just by protracting the scapulas. And that would actually be more beneficial if there was, let's say, a serratus anterior weakness. Over here is a row, which is a progression of just simple active scapular retraction. He's pulling something, so you're involving the glenohumeral joint and elbow joints as well, uh, in addition to the rhomboids and middle traps and other things. And over here in prone, this would be some horizontal abduction. So initially the arms are like this, and he's gonna lift them up to like here, okay? on either side. And that's also gonna work the middle traps and rhomboids. Again, these are just some examples. By no means are they all of them. But in general, that muscle retraining, target the impairments, but specifically focus a lot on those neck muscles, especially the endurance muscles, and then also the shoulder girdle. Now, one more important thing. Patients in this classification are going to have neck pain with some of these movements, okay? They're probably gonna have some neck pain at rest. So their lowest level might be a one or a two, maybe even a three out of 10, okay? 
And when you do some of these movements, the pain may increase by one or two. Okay? Now, you obviously don't want to do a particular movement if it increases it by like seven and brings it up to a nine out of 10 pain. But you're not going to be able to avoid some pain for these patients in a lot of cases. So this treatment is going to be respective of pain, but not guided by it. What we mean by not guided by pain is that it's going to be hard to do any treatment with no increase in pain. It's going to be hard. There's going to be a little bit of increase with some of these movements. Okay? These are their impairments, right? So if they come in with a 3 out of 10 neck pain and this exercise maybe takes it up to a 4 or a 5, that's probably okay. You don't want to let it get up to an 8 or a 9, of course. But understand there's going to be some pain with this. And as you start to get some of this endurance in these muscles back and strengthen these muscles back, the pain will go down over time. Okay? So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the examination and clinical presentation and treatments for somebody in class two, neck pain with movement coordination impairments. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.